I vow, Mr. Hardcastle, you're very particular. Mm -hmm. Is there a creature in the whole country but ourselves that does not take a trip to town now and then to rub off the rust a little? There's the two Miss Hogs and our neighbour, Mrs. Grisby, go to take a month's polishing every winter. Uh, and bring back vanity and affectation to last them the whole year. <laughs> I wonder why London cannot keep its own fools at home. Hmm? I mean, my time, the followers of the town crept slowly among us, but... But now they travel faster than a stagecoach. Ah, your times were fine times indeed. You've been telling us of them for many a long year. Here we live in an old rambling mansion that looks for all the world like an inn, but that we never see company. What? Our best visitors are old Mrs. Oddfish, the curate's wife, and little Cripplegate, the lame dancing master, and all our entertainment. Your stories of Prince Eugene and the Duke of Marlborough. <laughs> I hate such old-fashioned trumpery. Mm, and I love it. I love everything that's old. Old friends, old times, old manners, old books, old wine. And I believe, Dorothy, you'll own I've been pretty fond of an old wife. <laughs> oh, Mr. Hardcastle, you're forever at your Dorothy's and your old wives. You may be a Darby, but I'll be no Joan, I promise you. I'm not as old as you would make me. Add 20 to 20 and make money of that. Now, let me see. 20 added to 20 makes just... Uh, uh, Fifty and seven. Oh, it is mm -hmm. false, Mr. Hardcastle. I was but twenty when I was brought to bed of Tony that I had by Mr. Lumpkin, my first husband, and he's not come to years of discretion yet. No, nor ever will I dare answer for him. I, you've taught him finely. Oh, no matter. Tony Lumpkin has a good fortune. My son is not to live by his learning. I don't think a boy wants much learning to spend fifteen hundred a year. <laughs> learning. Learning, quote, a, a mere composition of tricks and mischief. Humour, my dear, nothing but humour. Come, Mr. Hardcastle, you must allow the boy a little humour. I'd sooner allow him a horse pond. If burning the footman's shoes, frightening the maids, and worrying the kittens be humour, he has it. <laughs> it was but yesterday he fastened my wig to the back of my chair, and when I went to make a bow, I, I, I popped my bald head into Mrs. Frizzle's face. <laughs> humor. And am I to blame? Poor boy's always been too sickly to do any good. A school would be his death. Mm. When he comes to be a little stronger, who knows what a year or two's Latin may do for him. <laughs> Latin? Latin for him? A <laughs> cat and a fiddle. No, no, no. The alehouse and the stable are the only schools he'll ever go to. Well, we must not snub the poor boy now, for I believe we shan't have him long among us. Mm. Anyone that looks at his face may see he's consumptive. But I've grown too fat to be one of the symptoms. He coughs sometimes. Oh, yes, yes, when his liquor goes the wrong way. I'm actually afraid of his lungs. Oh, and truly so am I. Oh, <laughs> so am I. Uh, there he goes. No, oh, a very consumptive figure, truly. Tony, where are you going, my charmer? Won't you give Papa and I a little of your company, lovely? Oh, I'm in haste, Mother. I can't stay. You shan't venture out this raw evening, with you. You look most shocking. I can't stay, I tell you. The three pigeons expect me down every moment. There's some fun going forward. Uh, the alehouse, I thought so. A low, paltry set of fellows. Not so loud, neither. There's Dick Muggins, the excise man, Jack Slang, the horse doctor, Little Amina Dab that grinds the music box, and Tom Twist that spins the pewter platter. Pray, me dear, disappoint them for one night at least. As for disappointing them, I should not so much mind, but I can't avoid to disappoint myself. You shan't go. I will, I no, tell you. No, you shan't, I say. We'll see what is strongest in you. <laughs> All right! <laughs> uh, there goes a pair that only spoil each other. Oh, there's my pretty darling, Kate. Ooh, the fashions of the time have almost infected her, too. By living a year or two in town, she's as fond of gauze and French frippery as the best of them. <laughs> oh, blessings on my pretty innocence. Mm. Oh, dressed out as usual, my Kate. Oh, goodness, what a quantity of superfluous silk has I got about the girl. And I never could teach the fools of this age that the indigent world could be clothed out of the trimmings of the vein. You know our agreement, sir. You allow mm. me the morning to receive and pay visits and to dress in my own manner. And in the evening I put on my housewife's dress to please you. Mm, well, remember, I insist on the terms of our agreement. <laughs> mm, yes, and by the by, mm? I, I, I believe I shall have occasion to, to test your obedience this very evening. I protest, sir, I don't comprehend your meaning. Then, to be plain with you, Kate, I expect a young gentleman. I have chosen to be your husband. Huh? <laughs> uh, from town this very day. I have oh. his father's letter in which he informs me his son is set out and that he intends to follow him shortly afterwards. Oh, indeed. I wish I had known something of this before. 
Bless me, how shall I behave? It's a thousand to one I shan't like him. Our meeting will be so formal and so like a thing of business that I shall find no room for friendship or esteem. Uh, well, depend upon it, child, I'll never control your choice. No, but Mr. Marlowe, whom I have pitched upon, is the son of my old friend Sir Charles Marlowe, of whom you've heard me talk so often. <laughs> no, the young gentleman has been bred a scholar and is designed for an employment in the service of his country. I, I'm told he's a man of excellent understanding. Is he? Yes, and very generous. I believe I shall like no, him. Young and brave. Oh, I'm sure I shall like him. Oh, and, and very handsome. Oh, my dear papa, say no more. <laughs> he's mine, I'll have him. And to crown all, Kate... He is one of the most bashful and reserved young fellows in all the world. Oh, you've frozen me to death again. Mm -hmm. That word reserved has undone all the rest of his accomplishments. A reserved lover, it is said, always makes a suspicious husband. On the contrary, modesty seldom resides in a breast that is not enriched with nobler virtues. <laughs> it was a very feature of his character that first struck me. He must have more striking features to catch me, I promise you. However, if he be so young, so handsome, and so everything, as you mentioned... I believe he'll still do. I think I'll have him. Oh. Well, Kate, there's still an obstacle. Mm -hmm. It's more than an even wager he may not have you. <laughs> My dear Papa, why will you mortify one so? <laughs> Well, if he refuses, instead of breaking my heart at his indifference, I'll only break my glass for its flattery, set my cap to some newer fashion, and look out for some less difficult admirer. Mm, bravely resolved, Kate. In the meantime, I'll go and prepare the servants for his reception. As we seldom see company, they want as much training as a company of recruits in the first day's muster. Lud, this news of Papa's puts me all in a flutter. Young, handsome, these he puts last, but I put them foremost. Sensible, good-natured, I like all that, but then reserved and sheepish. That's much against him. Yet can't he be cured of his timidity by being taught to be proud of his wife? Yes, and can't I? <laughs> but I vow I'm disposing of the husband before I have secured the lover. Hey! Oh, I'm glad you're come, Neville, my dear. Tell me, Constance, how do I look this evening? Is it one of my well-looking days, child? Am I in face today? Oh, perfectly, my dear. Yet now I look again. Bless me. Sure no accident has happened among the canary birds or the goldfishes? Has your brother or the cat been meddling, or has the last novel been too moving? No, nothing of all this. I have been threatened. Oh, I can scarce get it out. I have been threatened with a lover. And his name? Is Marlowe. Indeed. The son of Sir Charles Marlowe. As I live. The most intimate friend of Mr. Hastings, my admirer. Oh. Well, they are never asunder. I believe you must have seen him when we lived in town. Never. He's a very singular character, I assure you. Among women of reputation and virtue, he is the modestest man alive. But his acquaintance give him a very different character among creatures of another stamp. Oh. You understand me? An odd character indeed. I shall never be able to manage him. What shall I do? Ah, I think no more of him but trust to occurrences for success. But how goes on your own affair, my dear? Has my mother been courting you for my brother Tony as usual? Oh, I have just come from one of our agreeable tete-a-tetes. -tete. Oh. oh, she's been saying a hundred tender things and setting off her pretty monster as the very pink of perfection. And her partiality is such that she actually thinks him so. Fortune like yours is no small temptation. Besides, as she has the sole management of it, I'm not surprised to see her unwilling to let it go out of the family. A fortune like mine, which chiefly consists in jewels, is no such mighty temptation. However, I let her suppose that I'm in love with her son, and she never once dreams that my affections are fixed upon another. My good brother holds out stoutly. I could almost love him for hating you so. It is a good-natured creature at bottom, and I'm sure would wish to see me married to anybody but himself. My aunt's bell rings for our afternoon's walk round the improvements. Allons, courage is necessary. When it were bedtime and all were well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Let's go, my 
just as puzzle that brain with grammar and nonsense and learning. Good liquor I stoutly maintain gives genus a better discerning. Let them brag of their heathenish gods, their leafies, their sticks, and stygians, their quees and their quays and their quads. They're all but a parcel of pigeons. When <laughs> <laughs> Methodist preachers come down, a preaching that drinking is sinful. I wager the rascals a crown. They always preach best with a skin full. But when you come down with your pence for a slice of that scurvy religion, I'll leave it to all men of sense. But you be good friend of the pigeon. <laughs> <laughs> he can put the jorum about and let us be merry and clever. Our hearts and our liquors are stout. Is the three jolly pigeons for <laughs> Some cry up woodcock or hare. You busted your ducks and your widgeons. But of all the birds in the air, is the health of the three jolly pigeons. They're all over the squire's got spunk in him. Oh, he loves to hear him sing because he never gives us nothing that's low. I damn anything that's low. I cannot bear it. He's a genteel thing. He's a genteel thing at any time. Here we shall be that a gentleman be in a con... con... concessionation accordingly. I like the maxim of it, Master Muggins. What? Though I am obligated to dance a bear, a man may be a gentleman for all that. May this be my poison if my bear ever dances but to the very genteelest of tunes, water parted or the minuet in Ariadne. Yeah. Uh, what a pity it is the squire is not coming to his own. Oh. It would be well for all the publicans within ten miles round of him. Oh, eh? God, I'm <laughs> so it would, Master Slank. I then shall what it was to keep choice of company. Oh, he takes after his own father for that. Uh, to be sure, old Squire Lumpkin was the finest gentleman I ever set my eyes on. Winding the straight horn or beating a thicket for a hare or a winch, he never had his fellow. Oh, uh, he was a saying in the place that he kept the best horses, dogs and girls in the whole country. Oh, hey, God, and when I'm of age, I'll be no bastard, I promise you. I've been thinking of Bet Bouncer and the Miller's Grey Mary to begin with. <laughs> but come, my boys, drink a bell and be merry for you, by no reckoning. <laughs> well, Steve, down, wasn't it? There'll be two gentlemen in post chaise at the door. They've lost their way upon the forest. They're talking something about Mr. Hardcastle. And sure as can be, one of them must be the gentleman that's coming down to court my sister. Uh, do they seem to be Londoners? I believe they may. They look wounded like Frenchmen. Then desire them to step this way and I'll set them right in a twinkling. <laughs> Gentlemen, as they may have been good enough company for you, step down for a moment, and I'll be with you in a squeezing of the lemon. Father-in-law has been calling me a whelp and hound this half year. Now, if I pleased, I could be so revenged upon the old Grumbletonian. But then I'm afraid... Afraid of what? I shall soon be worth 1500 a year, and let him frighten me out of that if he can. Tedious, uncomfortable day we had of it. <sighs> we were told it was but 40 miles across the country and we have come above three score. And all, Marlow, from that unaccountable reserve of yours that would not let us inquire more frequently on the way. I own Hastings. I am unwilling to lay myself under an obligation to everyone I meet and often stand the chance of an unmannerly answer. Oh. No offence, gentlemen, but I'm told you've been inquiring for one Mr. Hardcastle in these parts. Uh, do you know what part of the country you're in? Not in the least, sir, but should thank you for information. Nor the way you came? Uh, no, sir, but if you can inform Why, us... gentlemen, if you know neither the road you're going nor where you are nor the road you came, the first thing I'd like to inform you is that you've lost your way. We wanted uh, no ghost to tell us that. But, uh, gentlemen, may I be so bold as to ask the place from which you came? That's not necessary towards directing us where we are to go. Oh, no offence, but question for question's all fair, you know. Uh, but, pray, gentlemen... It's not the same Harcastle lady, a cross-grained, old-fashioned, whimsical fella, with an ugly face, a daughter, and a pretty son. We have not seen the gentleman, but he has the family you mentioned. A daughter at all, traipsing, trolloping, talkative maypole. 
The son, a pretty, well-bred, agreeable youth. Everybody is fond of him. Our information differs in this. The daughter is said to be well-bred and beautiful. The son, an awkward booby, reared up and spoiled at his mother's apron. <coughs> and gentlemen, all I have to tell you is that you won't reach Mr. Arcastle's house this night, I believe. <sighs> it's a damn long, dark, boggy, dirty, dangerous way. Stingo, tell the gentleman the way to Mr. Arcastle's. Mr. Hardcastle's of Quagmire Marsh, you understand me. Master Hardcastle's? Lack a daisy, my master, you've come a deadly deal wrong. When you came to the bottom of the hill, you should have crossed down Squash Lane. Cross down Squash Lane? Then you were to keep straight forward until you came to Four Road. Four Road? Yeah, aye, but you must be sure to take only one of them. Oh, sir. And then keeping to the right, you're to go sideways until you come upon Crackskull Common. And there you must look sharp for the track of the wheel and go forward till you come to Farmer Morin's barn. And come into the farmer's barn, you turn to the right and to the left and to the right about again till you find the old mill. So, that's uh, man, he could as soon find out the longitude. What's to be done, Marlowe? This house promises but a poor reception. Uh, though perhaps the landlord can accommodate us. Well, like master, we have but one spare bed in the whole house. And to my knowledge, that's taken up by three lodges already. Oh, you pity. Don't you think, Stingo, our landlady could accommodate the gentleman by the fireside oh. with three chairs and a bolster? I hate sleeping by the fireside. And I detest your three chairs and a bolster. You do, do you? Then let me see. What if you go on a mile further? Into the buck's head. The old buck's head on the hill. One of the best inns in the old Celtic. Oh, 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 so we have escaped an adventure for this night, however. Sure, you've been sending them to your father's at an inn, be you? Mum, you fool, you let them find it out. You've only to keep on straight forward till you come to a large old house by the roadside. Uh, you see a pair of large horns over the door. That's the sign. Drive up the yard and call stoutly about you. Sir, we're obliged to you. Um, the servants can't miss the way. No, no. Uh, uh, but I tell you, though, uh, the landlord is rich and going to leave off business. So he wants to be thought a gentleman saving your presence. <laughs> <laughs> he'll, he'll be forgiving you his company. And he could, if you mind him, he'll persuade you that his mother was an older man and his aunt a justice of peace. <laughs> <laughs> a troublesome old blade, to be sure. But it keeps as good wines and beds as any in the old country. Well, if he supplies us with these, we shall want no further connection. Uh, we are to turn to the right, did you say? No, no, it's straightforward. Well, I'll just step myself and show you a piece of the way. Mum. Ah, uh, bless your heart for a sweet present. Them mischievous son of a whore. Perfect in the table exercise I've been teaching you these three days. Oh, huh? yes, sir. You all know your posts and your places, yes, and can show that you've been used to good company without ever stirring from home. Oh, I, 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 uh, good, good. Now, when company comes, you're not to pop out and stare and then run in again like frightened rabbits in a warren. Oh, <laughs> no. Oh, no. You, Diggory, whom I have taken from the barn, are to make a show at the side table. And you, Roger, uh, whom I have advanced from the plough, are to place yourself behind my chair. Hmm? Oh, I, I sir. Yeah. Yeah, but you're not to stand so with your hands in your pockets. <laughs> uh, take your hands from your pockets, Roger. Oh, and from your head, you blockhead. Look, see how Diggory carries his hands, eh? Huh? Well, they're a little too stiff indeed, but that's no great matter, Roger. I may never hold them. I learned all my ends this way when I was a pun trail for the militia. Quite so right. being a pun trail, I take my end here. You, 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 you must be so talkative, Dickory. You must be all attention to the guests. You must hear us talk and not think of talking. <laughs> you must see us drink and not think of drinking. You must see us eat and <laughs> not think of eating. Oh, by the Lord, your worship, that's perfectly impossible. Huh? Whenever Diggory sees eating going forward, well, he God, he's always wishing for a mouthful himself. Oh, Blockhead is not a bellyful in the kitchen, as good as a bellyful in the parlour. Oh, stay your stomach, Diggory, with that reflection. He could. I thank your worship. That's all right. I, I'd make a shift to stay my stomach with a slice uh, of cold beef in a pantry. Uh, Diggory, Diggory, you're too talkative. Now, if I happen to say a good thing, or, or tell a good story at table. You mustn't all burst out a laughing as if you made part of the company. <laughs> <laughs> then you cut your 
Bishop must not tell the story of old Graves in the gun room. <laughs> I, I can't help laughing at that. <laughs> Oh, what a life for me. I will laugh at that story these 20 years. The story is a good one, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 honest degree. You may laugh at that, <laughs> but still remember to be attentive. Now, I suppose one of the company should call for a glass of wine. Huh? Now, how will you behave? Hmm? Now, a glass of wine, sir, if you please. A glass of wine, I... Diggory, why don't you move? Oh, you got your worship. I never have courage till I see the eatables and drinkables brought upon the table. Then I'm bold as a lion. What? Will nobody move? Oh, I, I'm not to leave this place. Uh, I'm sure it's no place of mine. Nor mine for certain. Well, I'm sure it cannot be mine. Oh, you numbskulls. So while I like a better, you're quarrelling for places. The guests must be starved. No, you dunces. I, I find I must begin all over again. Don't I hear a coach drive into the yard? Yes, yes, to your post, you blockheads. Move, diggity, move, Roger. While I go and give my old friend son a hearty welcome at the gate. My place is quite good, in my age. My place is to be everywhere. Where the devil is mine? Please, I oh. know where I told you I go about my business. Welcome, gentlemen, very welcome. This way. Ah. After the disappointments of the day, welcome once more, Charles, to the comforts of a clean room and a good fire. Ah. Upon my word, a very well-looking house. Antique, but creditable. Though the usual fate of a large mansion. Having first ruined the master by good housekeeping, it at last comes to levy contributions as an ill. Mm. As you say, we passengers are to be taxed to pay all these dineries. I've often seen a good sideboard or a marble chimney piece, though not actually put in the bill, in flame a reckoning confoundedly. <laughs> Travellers, George, must pay in all places. The only difference is that in good inns you pay dearly for luxuries, in bad inns you are fleeced and starved. You live pretty much among them. In truth, I've been often surprised that you, who've seen so much of the world with your natural good sense and your many opportunities, could never yet acquire a requisite share of assurance. The Englishman's malady. But tell me, George, where could I have learned that assurance you talk of? My life has been chiefly spent in a college or an inn, in seclusion from that lovely part of the creation that chiefly teach men confidence. But among females of another class, you know... Aye, among I... them you're impudent enough of all conscience. <laughs> they are of us, you know. But in the company of women of reputation, I never saw such an idiot, such a trembler. You look for all the world as if you wanted an opportunity of stealing out of the room. My man, that's because I do want to steal out of the room. <laughs> Faith, I have often formed a resolution to break the ice and rattle away at any rate, but I don't know how. A single glance from a pair of fine eyes has totally overset my resolution. <laughs> An impudent fellow may counterfeit modesty, but I'll be hanged if a modest man can ever counterfeit impudence. If you could say but half the fine things to them that I've heard you lavish upon the barmaid of an inn, or even a college bedmaker... George, I can't say fine things to them. They freeze, they petrify me. They may talk of a comet, or a burning mountain, or some such bagatelle, but to me... A modest woman dressed out in all her finery is the most tremendous object in the whole creation. <laughs> well, at this rate, man, how can you ever expect to marry? Oh, never. Unless, as among kings and princes, my bride were to be courted by proxy. If, indeed, like an eastern bridegroom, one were to be introduced to a wife he never saw before, it might be endured. But to go through all the terrors of a formal courtship, together with the episode of aunts, grandmothers and cousins, and at last to blurt out the broad staring question of, Madam, will you marry me? No, 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 that's uh, a strain much above me, I assure you. Well, I pity you. But how do you intend behaving to the lady or come down to visit at the request of your father? As I behave to all other ladies, bow very low. Answer yes or no to all her demands, but for the rest, I don't think I shall venture to look in her face till I see my father's again. I'm surprised that one who is so warm a friend can be so cool a lover. To be explicit, my dear Hastings, my chief inducement down was to be instrumental in forwarding your happiness, not my own. Miss Neville loves you. The family don't know you, and, as my friend, you are sure of a reception, and let honour do the rest. My dear Marlowe, I... but I'll suppress the emotion. Now, were I a wretch, meanly seeking to carry off a fortune, you should be the last man in the world I would apply to for assistance. 
But Miss Neville's person is all I ask, and that is mine, both from her deceased father's consent and her own inclination. Happy man. Mm -hmm. You have talents and art to captivate any woman. I'm doomed to adore the sex and yet to converse with the only part of it I despise. This stammer in my address and this awkward, unprepossessing visage of mine can never permit me to soar above the reach of a milliner's apprentice or one of the duchesses of Drury Lane. <laughs> uh, this fellow here to interrupt us. Mm. Uh, gentlemen, once more you are heartily welcome. Which is Mr. Marlowe? Sir? Hmm? Uh, sir, you are heartily welcome. No, it's not my way, you see, to receive my friends with my back to the fire. No, 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 I like to give them a, a hearty reception in the old style, at my gate. <laughs> yes, I, I like to see their horses and their trunks taken care of. But I know oh, some I, servants I, already. Mm. But, uh, we approve your caution and hospitality, sir. Mm. I'm thinking, you. George, of changing our travelling dresses in the morning. Mm. I've grown confoundedly ashamed of mine. I beg, Mr. Marlowe, you use no ceremony in this house. Yes, I fancy, Charles, you're right. The first blow is half the battle. What? I intend opening the campaign with the white and the gold. Oh, but Mr. Marlowe, Mr. Hastings, gentlemen, pray be under no constraint in this house. <laughs> this is Liberty Hall, gentlemen. You may do just as you please here. Yeah, George, uh, if we open the campaign too fiercely at first, we may want ammunition before it is over. I think, I think to reserve the embroidery to secure a retreat. Uh, retreat? Oh, you know, you're talking of a retreat, Mr. Marlowe. <laughs> Puts me in mind of the Duke of Marlborough you know, when he went to besiege Dana. Now, he first summoned the garrison. Don't you think the uh, Voltador uh, waistcoat will do well with the plain brown? Uh, oh, um... Uh, he, he, he first summoned the garrison, gentlemen, which might consist of about about 5,000 men. No, I think well, not. Brown and yellow mixed, hmm? but very poorly. I see. Uh, gentlemen... As I was telling you, the Duke, the Duke, he first summoned the garrison, which might consist of about the 5,000 men well appointed with, like with, with ammunition. Hmm? Uh, oh, where was I? Uh, uh, about 5,000 men well appointed with stores, ammunition, and, and other implements of war. Now, says the Duke of Marlborough, uh, to George Brooks, uh, that stood next to him. Uh, you must have heard of George Brooks, huh? <laughs> yes. I'll pour my dukedom, says he, but I take that garrison without spilling a drop of blood. <laughs> so, what, what, my good friend, if you gave us a glass of punch in the meantime, it will help us to carry on the siege with vigour. Punch, sir? Uh, yes, sir, punch. A glass of warm punch after our journey will be comfortable. This is Liberty Hall, you know. <laughs> this is the most unaccountable kind of modesty I ever met with. Uh, here is a cup, sir. Sir, this fellow in his Liberty Hall will only let us have just what he pleases. I hope you'll find it to your mind. I prepared it with my own hands, and I believe you'll own the ingredients are tolerable. Uh, will you be so good as to pledge me, sir, Mr. Marlowe? Here is to our better acquaintance, sir. Huh? The impudent <laughs> fellow this, but he's a character, and I'll humour him a little. Mm? Sir, my yes. service to you. Uh, thank you I thank see you this fellow you. wants to give us his company and forgets that he's an innkeeper before he has learned to be a gentleman. Uh, mm. From the excellence of your cup, my old friend, I suppose you have a good deal of business in this part of the country. Warm work now and then at elections, I suppose. No, 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 <laughs> sir. I have long given that work over. Ever since our betters have hit upon the expedient of electing each other. <laughs> <laughs> so then, you have no turn for politics, I find. No, not in the least. No, no, no. There was a time, indeed, that I fretted myself about the mistakes of government, like other people, but finding myself every day grow more angry, and the government growing no better, I left it to mend itself. <laughs> <laughs> Since then, I no more trouble my head about Hyde and Alley or Alley Corn than... What about Annie Crocker? So <laughs> <laughs> my service to you. So that with eating above stairs and drinking below, with receiving your friends within and amusing them without, you lead a good, pleasant, bustling life of it. Hmm? Mm -hmm. No, yeah, I, 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 I do stir about a good deal, that's certain, mm -hmm. yes. Half the differences of the parish are adjusted in this very parlour. Mm. And you have an argument in your cup, old gentleman, better than any in Westminster Hall. Mm. Oh, aye, 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 young gentleman. Mm -hmm. That and a little philosophy. Oh, this is the first time I ever heard of an innkeeper's philosophy. So then, like an experienced general, you attack them on every quarter. If you find their reason manageable, you attack them with your philosophy. If you find they have no reason, you attack them with this. Here's your health, my philosopher. <laughs> <laughs> good, that's very good. Thank you. Thank you. You know, you your generalship puts me in mind of Prince Eugene when he fought the Turks at the Battle of Belgrade. Oh, you shall hear. Instead of the yeah. Battle of Belgrade, I believe it's almost time to talk about supper. What has your philosophy got in the house for supper? 
For supper, sir? Hmm. Was ever such a request to a man in his own house? Yes, sir, supper, sir. I begin to feel an appetite. I shall make devilish work tonight in the larder, I promise you. <laughs> the brazen dog. Well, really, sir, for, for supper, I can't well tell. My Dorothy and the cookmaid settle these things between them. I, I leave these kind of things entirely to them. You do, do you? Oh, yes, entirely. By the by, I believe they're in actual consultation about what will suffer at this moment in the kitchen. Then I beg they'll admit me as one of their privy council. It's what? a way I have got. When I travel, I always choose to regulate my own supper. And let the cook be called. Uh, uh, no uh, offence, I hope, sir. Uh, uh, no, 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 none in the least, no. Uh, yet I don't know how. Uh, Bridget, the cookmaid, is not very communicative on these occasions. Should we send for her? She she might scold us all out of the house. Oh, oh. Let's see your list of the larder, then. I ask it as a favour. I always match my appetite to my bill of fare. Sir, he's very right, and it's my way, too. Oh, is it? Oh, sir, you have a right to command here. Uh, uh, Diggory! Uh, Roger! <laughs> uh, uh, fetch us the bill of fare for, for, for tonight's supper. Uh, I, I, I believe it's an all out. You know, your manner, Mr. Hastings, puts me in mind of my uncle, Colonel Wallop, who, it was a saying of his, that no man was sure of his supper until he had eaten it. <laughs> <laughs> all upon the high ropes, uh, his you. uncle, the Colonel. We shall soon hear of his mother being a justice of peace. Ah, but uh, let's hear the bill of fare. Yes. <laughs> What's in? <laughs> For the first course. <laughs> <laughs> for the second course. <laughs> for the dessert. <laughs> the devil, sir, do you think we brought down the whole joiners' company or the Corporation of Bedford to eat up such a supper? <laughs> Two or three little things, clean and comfortable, will do. But let's hear it. For the first course. Mm. At the top. Yeah. A pig and prune sauce. Oh, 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 damn your pig, I say. And damn your prune sauce, say I. <laughs> yeah, gentlemen, two men that are hungry... Pig with prune sauce is very good eating. At the bottom, mm. a calf's tongue and brains. Oh, let your brains be knocked out, my good sir. I don't like them. Or you may clap them on a plate by themselves. I do. Biddle scumfounds me. Gentlemen, you are my guests. Make what alterations you please. Is there anything else that you wish to retrench or, or alter, gentlemen? <laughs> Item. Mm. A pork pie, mm. a boiled rabbit and yeah. sausages, a florentine, oh. a shaking pudding, <laughs> and a dish of tiff taff taffety cream. Oh, confound your made dishes. I shall be as much at a loss in this house as at a green and yellow dinner at the French ambassador's table. <laughs> I'm for plain eating. I'm sorry, gentlemen, that I have nothing that you like. But if there be anything that you have a particular fancy to... Why, really, sir, your bill of fare is so exquisite that any one part of it is full as good as another. Send us what you please. So much for supper. And now to see that our beds are aired and properly taken care of. I entreat you leave all that to me. You shall not stir a step. Leave that to you. I protest, sir, you must excuse me. I always look to these things myself. I, I, I must insist, sir. You make yourself easy on that head. You see, I'm resolved on it. Very troublesome fellow as ever I met with. Well, sir, I am resolved at least to attend you. Oh, this may be modern modesty, but I never saw anything look so like old-fashioned impudence. Mr. Marlowe, please. So, I find this fellow's civilities begin to grow troublesome. But who can be angry with those assiduities which are meant to please him? What do I see? Miss Neville, by all that's happy. My dear Hastings, to what unexpected good fortune, to what accident am I to ascribe this happy meeting? Rather, let me ask the same question, as I could never have hoped to meet my dearest Constance at an inn. An inn? We're sure you mistake. My aunt, my guardian, lives here. Mm -hmm. What could induce you to think this house an inn? My friend, Mr. Marlowe, with whom I came down, and I have been sent here as to an inn, I assure you. A young fellow whom we accidentally met at a house hard by directed us hither. Oh, certainly. It must be one of my hopeful cousin's tricks, of oh. whom you've heard me talk so often. <laughs> he whom your aunt intends for you, he of whom I have such just apprehensions. Oh, you have nothing to fear from him, I assure you. You'd adore him if you knew how heartily he despises me. My aunt knows it, too. 
and has undertaken to court me for him and actually begins to think she has made a conquest. Oh, dear dissembler. You must know, my Constance, I've just seized this happy opportunity of my friend's visit here to get admittance into the family. The horses that carried us down are now fatigued with the journey, but they'll soon be refreshed, and then, if my dearest girl will trust in her faithful Hastings, we shall soon be landed in France, where even among slaves the laws of marriage are respected. I have often told you that, though ready to obey you, I yet should leave my little fortune behind with reluctance. The greatest part of it was left me by my uncle, the India director and chiefly consists of jewels. I have been for some time persuading my aunt to let me wear them. I fancy I am very near succeeding. The instant they are put in my possession, you shall find me ready to make them and myself yours. Perish the baubles. Your person is all I desire. Oh, but in the meantime, my friend Marlowe must not be let into his mistake. I know the strange reserve of his temper is such that if abruptly informed of it, he would instantly quit the house before our plan was ripe for execution. But how shall we keep him in the deception? Miss Hardcastle has just returned from walking. What if we still continue to deceive him? Yes. <gasps> this, this way. The assiduities of these good people tease me beyond bearing. My host seemed to think it ill manners to leave me alone, so he claps not only himself, but his old-fashioned wife on my back. They talk of coming to sup with us, too, and then, I suppose, we are to run the gauntlet through all the rest of the family. What have we got here? My dear Charles, let me congratulate you. The most fortunate accident. Who do you think has just alighted? Cannot guess. Our mistress's boy, Miss Hardcastle and Miss Neville. Give me leave to introduce Miss Constance Neville to your acquaintance. Sir? Uh, madam. Happening to dine in the neighbourhood, they called on their return to take uh, fresh horses here. <laughs> Miss Hardcastle has just stepped into the next room and will be back in an instant. Wasn't it lucky? Eh? I've just been mortified enough of all conscience, and here comes something to complete my embarrassment. Well, but wasn't it the most fortunate thing in the world? Oh, yes. Very fortunate. A most uh, joyful encounter. But our dresses, George, you know, are in disorder. What if we should uh, postpone the happiness till tomorrow? Tomorrow at our own house. It'll be every bit as convenient and rather more respectful. Tomorrow, let it be. By no means, sir. Your ceremony will displease her. The disorder of your dress will show the ardour of your impatience. Besides, she knows you are in the house and will permit you to see her. Oh, the devil! How shall I support it? <coughs> Hastings, you must not go. You are to assist me, you know. I shall be confoundedly ridiculous. Yet, hang it, I'll take courage. <coughs> oh, man, it's but the first plunge and all's over. She's but a woman, you know. And of all women, she that I dread most to encounter. Miss Hardcastle, Sir. Mr. Marlowe, huh. I'm proud of bringing two persons of such merit together that only want to know to esteem each other. Now for meeting my modest gentleman with a demure face and quite in his own manner. I'm glad of your safe arrival, sir. I'm told you had some accidents, by the way. Only a few, madam. Yes, we had some. Yes, madam, a, a good many accidents, uh, but... Uh, should be sorry, madam, or rather glad of any accidents that are so agreeably concluded. Never spoke better in your whole life. Keep it up and I'll ensure the victory. I'm afraid you flatter, sir. You that have seen so much of the finest company can find little entertainment in an obscure corner of the country. I have lived, indeed, in the world, madam, but I have kept very little company. Excellent, excellent. I have been an observer upon life, madam, while others were enjoying it. But that, I am told, is the way to enjoy it best. Cicero never spoke better. Once more, and you're confirmed in assurance forever. <coughs> Stand by me, then. And when I'm down, throw in a word or two to set me up again. An observer like you upon life were, I fear, disagreeably employed, and you must have had much more to censure than to approve. Pardon me, madam. I was always willing to be amused. Folly, talk about folly. Hmm? But the folly of most people is rather an object of mirth than uneasiness. Oh, bravo. Never spoke so well in your whole life. Well, Miss Hardcastle. I see that you and Mr. Marlowe are going to be very good company. I believe our being here will but embarrass the interview. <laughs> Not in the least, Mr. Hastings. We like your company of all things. So, Miss George, or you won't go. How can you leave us? Our presence will but spoil conversation, so we'll retire to the next room. Don't consider, man, that we are to manage a little tete-a-tete -tete of our own. <sighs> But you have not been wholly an observer, I presume, sir. The ladies, I should hope, have employed some part of your addresses. Pardon me, madam. I, 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 as yet, have studied only to deserve them. And that, some say, is the very worst way to obtain them. Perhaps so, madam. 
but I love to converse only with the more grave and sensible part of the sex. Oh. But I'm afraid I grow tiresome. Oh, not at all, sir. There is nothing I like so much as grave conversation myself. I could hear it forever. Indeed, I've often been surprised how a man of sentiment could ever admire those light, airy pleasures when nothing reaches the heart. It's a disease of the mind, madam. In the variety of tastes, there must be some who... <clears throat> wanting a relish for, um, uh, um, uh... Oh, I understand you, sir. There must be some who, wanting a relish for refined pleasures, pretend to despise what they are incapable of tasting. My meaning, madam, but infinitely better expressed. And, uh, I, I can't help observing that in this age of hip hypocrisy, uh, who yeah, could exactly. ever suppose this fellow impudent upon some occasions? Uh, you were going to observe, sir? I was observing, madam. I protest, madam, I forget what I was going to observe. I vow, and so do I. Uh, you were observing, sir, that in this age of hypocrisy... Something about hypocrisy, sir? Yes, madam. In this age of hypocrisy, there are few who, upon strict inquiry, do, do not... Um, Oh, I understand you perfectly, sir. Again, that's more than I do myself. You mean that in this hypocritical age there are few that do not condemn in public what they practice in private and think they pay every debt to virtue when they praise it? True, madam. Those who have most virtue in their mouths have least of it in their uh, bosoms. Uh, but, but I see Miss Neville expecting us in the next room. I would not intrude for all the world. I protest, sir. I never was more agreeably entertained in all my life. Pray go on. Uh, yes, madam. I was... Um, uh, but she beckons us to join her. Uh, madam, shall I... Do myself the honour to attend you. Well, then, I'll follow. This pretty smooth dialogue had done for me. <laughs> Was there ever such a sober, sentimental interview? <laughs> it certainly scarce looked in my face the whole time. Yet the fellow, but for his unaccountable bashfulness, is pretty well, too. He has good sense, ah, but then so buried in his fears that it fatigues one more than ignorance. If I could teach him a little confidence... It would be doing somebody that I know of a piece of service. But who is that somebody? Hmm? That, Faith, is a question I can scarcely answer. What do you follow me for, Cousin John? I wonder you're not ashamed to be so very engaging. Well, I hope, Cousin, one may speak to one's own relations and not be to blame. Oh, yeah, but I know what sort of a relation you want to make me, though, but it won't do. I tell you, Cousin John, it won't do. So I beg you'll keep your distance. I want no nearer relations. <laughs> Well, I vow, Mr. Hastings, you're very entertaining. There's nothing in the world I love to talk of so much as London and the fashions. Though I was never there myself. Never there? Oh, you amaze me. From your air and manner, I concluded you'd been bred all your life, either at Ranelagh, St. James's, or Tower Wharf. Oh, sir, you're only pleased to say so. We country persons can have no manner at all. I'm in love with the town, and that serves to raise me above some of our neighbouring rustics. But who could have a manor that has never seen the Pantheon, the Grotto Gardens, the Borough, and such places where nobility chiefly resort? Ah, mm. All I can do is to enjoy London at second hand. I take care to know every tete-a-tete -tete from the scandalous magazine and have all the fashions as they come out in a letter from the two Miss Ricketts of Crooked Lane. Ah, mm. <laughs> uh, pray, how do you like this head, Mr. Hastings? Oh, it's Extremely elegant and dégagé, upon my word, madam. Your friseur is a Frenchman, I suppose. Oh, I protest. I dressed it myself from a print in the ladies' memorandum book for the last year. Indeed? Oh, such a head in the side box at the playhouse would draw as many gazers as my lady mayoress at a city ball. Uh, yet what signifies my dressing when I have such a piece of antiquity by my side as Mr. Hardcastle? Oh. All I can say will not argue down a single button from his clothes. I have often wanted him to throw off his great flaxen wig, and where he was bald, to plaster it over like my Lord Peatley with powder. You are right, madam. For as among the ladies there are none ugly, so among the men there are none old. But what do you think his answer was? Why, with his usual gothic vivacity, he said I only wanted him to throw off his wig to convert it into a tet for my own wearing. Intolerable. At your age you may wear what you please, and it must become you. Oh. Pray, Mr. Hastings, what do you take to be the most fashionable age about town? Some time ago, 40 was all the mode, but I'm told the ladies intend to bring up 50 for the ensuing winter. Seriously? Oh, then 
I should be too young for the fashion. <laughs> no lady begins now to put on jewels till she's past 40. For instance, Miss there in a polite circle would be considered as a child, a mere maker of samplers. And yet my niece thinks herself as much a woman and is as fond of jewels as the oldest of us all. Your niece is she? Oh, and the young gentleman, a brother of yours, I should presume. My son, sir. No. They are contracted to each other. Observe their little sports. Mm. They fall in and out ten times a day as if they were man and wife already. Yeah. <laughs> well, Tony, child, what soft things are you saying to your cousin Constance this evening? Never say no soft things, but it is very hard to be followed about so. Hey, God, I've not a place in the house that's left to myself but the stable. Never mind him, Conway, dear. He's another story behind your back. Oh. <laughs> He's a sly one. Don't you think they like each other about the mouth, Mr. Hastings? The blanket soft mouth to a T. They're of a size, too. Uh, back to back, my pretties, that Mr. Hastings may see you. Come to me. You are as good not make me, I tell you. Oh, look, he's almost cracked my head. Oh, the monster. For shame, Tony, you're a man who behaves so. And if I am a man, let me have my fortune. <gasps> hey, God, I'll not be made a fool of any longer. Is this ungrateful boy all I'm to get for the pains I've taken with your education? I that have rocked you in your cradle and fed that pretty mouth with a spoon. Did I not work that waistcoat to make you genteel? Did I not prescribe for you every day and weep while the medicine was working? Hey, God, you had reason to weep, for you've been dosing me ever since I was born. I have gone through every receipt in a complete housewife ten time over. And you have thoughts of coursing me through Quincy next spring. But he can I tell you, I'll not be made a fool of any longer. Wasn't it all for your good viper? Wasn't it all for your good? Oh, I wish you'd let me in my good alone and snub in this way when I'm in spirits. If I don't have any good, let it come of itself, not to keep dinging it, dinging it into oneself. That's false. I never see you when you're in spirit. No, Tony. You then go to the alehouse or kennel. I am never to be delighted with your agreeable wild notes, unfeeling monster. Thank God, Mama, your own notes are the wildest to the two. Was ever the like. But I see he wants to break my heart. I see he does. Dear madam, permit me to lecture the young gentleman a little. I'm certain I can persuade him to his duty. Well... I must retire. Come, Constance, my love. You see, Mr. Hastings, the wretchedness of my situation. Was ever a poor woman so plagued with a dear, sweet, pretty, provoking, and beautiful boy? There was a young man riding by, and fain would have his will. Rando, little lady, rando, little Oh, don't mind her, let her cry. It's the comfort of her heart. I've seen her and sister cry over a book for an hour together, and they said they liked the book the better the more it made him cry. Then you're no friend to the ladies, I find, my pretty young gentleman. As is I find him. Not to her of your mother's choosing, I dare answer. And yet, she appears to me a pretty well-tempered girl. That's because you don't know her as well as I. Hey, God, I know every inch about her, and there's not a more bitter cantankerous toad in all Christendom. Pretty encouragement, this for a lover. I've seen her since the height of that. She has as many tricks as air in a thicket or a coat the first day's breaking. To me, she appears sensible and silent. Aye, before company. But when she's with her playmate, she's as loud as a hog in a gate. But there is a meek modesty about her that charms me. Yeah, but Kerba, never so little she kicks up and you're flung in a ditch. Well, but you must allow her a little beauty. Oh, yes, you must allow her some beauty. Bandbox, she's all a made-up thing, man. Ah, could you but see bet bouncer of these parts? You might then talk of beauty. Because she has two eyes, as black as sloes, and cheeks as broad and red as a pulpit cushion. She'd make two a she. Well, what say you to a friend that would take this bitter bargain off your hands? Ah, uh, none. Would you thank him that would take Miss Neville and leave you to happiness and your dear Betsy? Aye, but where is there such a friend? For who would take her? I am he. Uh, what? If you but assist me, I'll engage to whip her off to France, and you shall never hear more of her. I assist you? Hey, God, I will, to the last drop of my blood. I'll clap a pair of horses to your chase that shall trundle you off in a twinkling, and maybe get you a part of her fortune beside in jewels that you little dream of. My dear <laughs> squire, this looks like a lad of spirit. Come along, then, and you shall see more of my spirit for you're done with me. <laughs> we are the boys that fear no noise when thundering heavens roar. Good, my 
old friend Sir Charles mean by recommending his son as the modestest young man in town? Uh, to me, he appears the most impudent piece of brass that ever spoke with a tongue. He has taken possession of my easy chair by the fireside. He, he took off his boots in the parlour and desired me to see them taken care of. <laughs> oh, here comes my Kate. I desire us to know how his impudence affects her. She will certainly be shocked by it. Oh, well, my Kate, I see you change your dress as I bid you. Hmm? And yet I believe there was no great occasion. I find such a pleasure, sir, in obeying your commands that I take care to observe them without ever debating their propriety. And yet, Kate, I sometimes give you cause, oh. <laughs> particularly when I recommended my modest gentleman to you as a lover today. You taught me to expect something extraordinary, and I find the original exceeds the description. Yes, I, I was never so surprised in my life. He has quite confounded all my faculties. I never saw anything like it, and a man of the world, too. Aye, aye, he learned it all abroad. <laughs> what a fool I was to think a man could learn modesty by travelling. He might as soon learn wit at a masquerade. It seems all natural to him. A good deal assisted by bad company and a French dancing master. Oh, sure, you mistake, Papa. A French dancing master could never have taught him that timid look, that awkward address, that, that bashful manner. Mm, uh, oh. Whose look? Whose manner, child? Who Mr. Marlowe's. But his mauvaise honte, his, his timidity, struck me at the first sight. Huh? And your first sight deceived you? Well, I think him one of the most brazen first sights that ever astonished my senses. Sure, sir, you rally. I never saw anyone so modest. But can, 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 can you be serious? <laughs> I never saw such a bouncing, swaggering puppy since I was born. Bully Dawson was but a fool to him. Surprise. He met me with a respectful bow, a stammering voice, and a look fixed on the ground. He met me with a loud voice, a lordly air, and a familiarity that made my blood freeze. He treated me with diffidence and respect, censured the manners of the age, admired the prudence of girls that never laughed, tired me with apologies for being tiresome, then left the room with a bow, and a madam I would not for the world detain you. He spoke to me as if he knew me all his life, asked twenty questions and never waited for an answer interrupted my best remarks with some silly pun, <laughs> and when I was in my best story, you know, the Duke of Marlborough mm. and Prince Eugene, he asked me if I had not a good hand at making punch. <gasps> yes, Kate, yes, yes, he asked your father if he was a maker of punch. Well, one of us must certainly be mistaken. Well, if he be what he has shown himself, I am determined he shall never have my consent. And if he be the sullen thing I take him, he shall never have mine. Well, in one thing we are agreed, <laughs> to reject him. Yes but upon conditions. For if you should find him less impudent and I more presuming, if you should find him more respectful and I more importunate, I don't know. The fellow is well enough for a man. Certainly we don't meet many such at a horse race in the country. If we should find him so, but that's impossible. The first appearance has done my business. Yet there may be many good qualities under that first appearance. Oh, aye. When a girl finds a fellow's outside to her taste, she then sets about guessing the rest of his furniture. <laughs> <laughs> With her, a smooth face stands for good sense and a genteel figure for every virtue. Oh, I hope, sir, a conversation begun with a compliment to my good sense won't end with a sneer at my understanding. Oh, pardon me, Kate, but if young Mr. Brazen can find the art of reconciling contradictions, well, he may please us both, perhaps. And as one of us must be mistaken, what if we go on to make further discoveries? Oh, oh, agreed, agreed. But depend upon it, I am in the right. And depend on, I'm not much in the wrong. Ecod, I've got them. Here they are. My cousin Con's necklaces, bobs and all. My mother shan't cheat the poor souls out of there for it, neither. Tony. Oh, my genus, is that you? My dear friend, how have you managed with your mother? I hope you've amused her with pretending love for your cousin and that you're willing to be reconciled at last. Yes. Our horses will be refreshed in a short time and we shall soon be ready to set off. And here's something to bear your charges, by the way. <laughs> your sweetheart's jewels. Keep them. And hang those I say that would rob you of one of them. But how have you procured them from your mother? Ask me no questions, I'll tell you no fibs. I procured them by the rule of thumb. If I had not a key to every drawer in mother's bureau, how could I go to the alehouse as often as I do? <laughs> An honest man may rob himself of his own at any time. Thousands do it every day. 
But um, to be plain with you, Miss Neville is endeavouring to procure them from her aunt this very instant. If she succeeds... Well, keep them till you know how it will be. But I know how it will be well enough. She'd as soon part with the only settled tooth in her head. But I dread the effects of her resentment when she finds she's lost them. Never you mind her resentment. Leave me to manage that. I don't value her resentment the bounce of a cracker. Pardon <laughs> Shoes in it they are. Oh, Morris Pratt. The indeed, Constance, you amaze me. Such a girl as you want jewels. It'll time enough with jewels, my dear. Twenty years hence, when your beauty begins to want repairs. But what will repair beauty at forty will certainly improve it at twenty, madam. Yours, my dear, can a bit of none. That natural blush is beyond a thousand ornaments. Besides, child, jewels are quite out at present. Don't you see half the ladies of our acquaintance? My Lady Kill Daylight and Mrs. Crump and the rest of them carry their jewels to town and bring nothing but paste and marker seats back. But who knows, madam, but somebody that shall be nameless would like me best with all my little finery about me. Consult your glass, my dear, and then see with such a pair of eyes you want any better sparklers. What do you think, Tony, my dear? Does your cousin Con want any jewels in your eyes to set off her beauty? That's as you're after, maybe. My dear aunt, if you knew how it would oblige me. A parcel of old-fashioned rose and table cup things. They would make you look like the court of King Solomon at a puppet show. Besides, I believe I can't readily come at them. They've been missing, for all I know, to the contrary. Then why don't you tell her so at once, as she's longing for him? Tell her they're lost. It's the only way to quiet her, say they're lost, and call me to bear witness. You know, me dear, I'm only keeping them for you. So if I say they're gone, you will bear me witness, will you? <laughs> <laughs> Never fear me. <laughs> hey, God, I'll say I saw them taken out with my own eyes. I desire them, but for a day, madam just to be permitted to show them as relics, and then they may be locked up again. To be plain with you, my dear Constance, if I could find them, you should have them. They're missing, I assure you, lost for aught I know, but we must have patience wherever they are. I'll not believe it. This is but a shallow pretense to deny me. I know they're too valuable to be so slightly kept in as you are to answer for the loss. Don't be alarmed, Constance. If they are lost, I must restore an equivalent. But my son knows they're missing and not to be found. That I can bear witness to. They are missing and not to be found. I'll take me out on. You must lend resignation, my dear. For though we lose our fortune, yet we should not lose our patience. See me, how calm I am. Aye, people are generally calm at the misfortune of others. Now I wonder a girl of your good sense should waste a thought upon such trumpery. We shall soon find them. And in the meantime, you shall have my garnets till your jewels be found. I detest garnets. The most becoming things in the world to set up a clear complexion. You have often seen how well they look upon me. I dislike them of all things. You shan't stir. You shall have them. Was ever anything so provoking? To mislay my own jewels and force me to wear trumpery. Don't be a fool. If she gives you the garnets, take what you can get. The jewels are your own already. I have stolen them out of her bureau and she does not know it. <laughs> Flighty your spark, he'll tell you more of the matter. Leave me to manage her. My dear cousin. Oh, 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 she's here and has missed them already. Zoom as how she fidgets and spits oh, them like a cavalry oh, queen. Me. Confusion. Thieves. Robbers. We're cheated, plundered, broke open, undone. Oh, what's the matter? What's the matter, Mama? I hope nothing has happened to any of the good family. We're robbed. My bureau has been broken open, the jewels taken out, and I am undone. Uh, oh, is that all? <laughs> By the laws, I never saw it better acted in my life. <laughs> God, I thought you was ruined in earnest. <laughs> oh, God, I am ruined in earnest. My piano has been broken up and an all taken away. Stick to that. <laughs> Stick to that. Oh, bear witness, you know. Call me to be a witness. I tell you, Tony, by all that's precious, the jewels are gone and I shall be ruined forever. You, I know they are gone and I am to say so. My dear Miss Tony, but hear me. They're gone, I say. Oh, my Lord's mamma. You make me a bit of love. <laughs> I know who took them well enough. <laughs> Lockhead, that can't tell the difference between jest and earnest. I tell you, I am not in jest, Ruby. That is right, that is right. You must be in a bit of passion, and then nobody will suspect either of us. I'll bear witness that you're gone, you know. Was ever such a cross grained brute that won't hear me? Can you bear witness that you're no better than a fool? Was ever poor woman so beset with fools on one hand and thieves on the other? I can bear witness to that. Bear witness again, you blockhead. You will now turn you out of the room directly. <laughs> My poor niece, what will become of her? <laughs> Do you laugh, you unfeeling brutus, if you enjoyed my distress? I can bear witness to that. Do you insult me, monster? I'll teach you to get your mother, I will. I can bear witness to that. <laughs> what an unaccountable creature is that brother of mine to send him to the house as an inn. <laughs> I don't 
one day at his impudence. <laughs> what is more, madam, the young gentleman as you pass by in your present dress asked me if you were the barmaid. He <laughs> mistook you for the barmaid, madam. Did he? <laughs> then as I live, I'm resolved to keep up the delusion. Tell me, Pimple, how do you like my present dress? Don't you think I look something like Cherry in the Bow Stratagem? Oh, tis a dress, madam, that every lady wears in the country, but when she visits or receives company. And are you sure he does not remember my face or person? Certain of it. I vow I thought so, for though we spoke for some time together, yet his fears were such that he never once looked up during the interview. Indeed, if he had, my bonnet would have kept him from seeing me. But what do you hope from keeping him in his mistake? In the first place. I shall be seen. That is no small advantage to a girl who brings her face to market. Then I shall perhaps make an acquaintance, and that is no small victory gained over one who never addresses any but the wildest of her sex. But my chief aim is to take my gentleman off his guard and, like an invisible champion of romance, examine the giant's force before I offer to combat. But are you sure you can act your part and disguise your voice so that he may mistake that as he's already mistaken your person? Never fear me. I think I've got the true bar can. Um, did your honor call? <laughs> Attendant lawyer <Lauren> there. <laughs> hey, send tobacco for the angel. <laughs> oh, it will do, madam. <laughs> oh, but he's here. <laughs> what a bawling in every part of the house. I have scarce a moment's repose. If I go to the best room, there I find my host and his story. If I fly to the gallery, there we have my hostess with her curtsy down to the ground. I have at last got a moment to myself, and now for recollection. Did you call, sir? Did your honor call? As for Miss Hardcastle, she's too grave and sentimental for me. Did your honor call? No, child. Besides, from the glimpse I had of her, I think she squints. I'm sure, sir, I heard the bell ring. No, no. I have pleased my father, however, by coming down, and I'll tomorrow please myself by return. Perhaps the other gentleman calls, sir. I tell you no. I should be glad to know, sir. We have such a parcel of servants. No, no, I tell... Yes, child, I think I did call. I wanted, uh, I want, uh, I vow, child, you are vastly handsome. Oh, la, sir, you make one ashamed. I never saw a more sprightly, malicious eye. Yes, yes, my dear, I did call. Have you got any of your, uh, uh, what do you call it in the house? No, sir, we've been out of that these ten days. <laughs> one may call in this house, I find a very little purpose. Suppose I should call for a taste just by way of trial of the nectar of your lips. Perhaps I might be disappointed in that, too. Nectar? Nectar, that's a liquor there's no call for in these parts. French, I suppose. We keep no French wines here, sir. Oh, true. English growth, I assure you. Then it's odd I should not know it. We brew all sorts of wines in this house, and I lived here these 18 years. 18 years? One would think, child, you kept the bar before you were born. How old are you? Oh, sir, I must not tell my age. They say women and music should never be dated. <laughs> to guess at this distance, you can't be much above 40. Oh. Yet... <laughs> Nearer? I don't think so, mine. <laughs> By coming close to some women, they look younger still, but when we come very close indeed... Pray, sir, keep your distance. Woman, think you wanted to know one's age as they do horses by mark of mouth. I protest, child, you use me extremely ill. If you keep me at this distance, how is it possible you and I can ever be acquainted? Who wants to be acquainted with you? I want no such acquaintance, not I. I'm sure you did not treat Miss Hardcastle that was here a while ago in this obstropolous manner. I'll warrant me, before her you looked dashed and kept bowing to the ground and talked for all the world as if you was before a justice of the peace. Thank God she's hit it short enough. <laughs> in a lot of her, child. <laughs> a mere awkward squinting thing. No, no. I find you don't know me. I laughed and rallied her a little, but I was unwilling to be too severe. No, I could not be too severe, curse me. Oh, then, sir, you were a favourite, I find, among the ladies. Yes, my dear, a great favourite. Oh. <laughs> and yet, hang me, I don't see what they find in me to follow. At the ladies' club in town, I'm called their agreeable rattle. Oh. Uh, rattle, child, is not my real name, uh, but one I'm known by. Uh, my name is Solomons. <laughs> uh, Mr. Solomons, my dear, at your service. Hold, sir. You were introducing me to your club, not to yourself. 
And you're so great a favourite there, you say? Yes, my dear, there's Mrs. Mantrap, Lady Betty Blackleg, the Countess of Slingo, Mrs. Oh. Longhorns, and old Miss Biddy Buckskin, and your humble servant. Keep up the spirit of the place. Oh, then it's a very merry place, I suppose. Yes, as merry as cards, supper, wine, and old women can make us. And their agreeable rattle, hmm? <laughs> hey, girl, I don't quite like this chin. She looks knowing with things. Uh, you uh, laugh, child. I can't my laugh to think what time they all have her money and their work and their family. All's well, she don't laugh at me. Do you ever work, child? I sure. There's not a screen or a quilt in the whole house but can bear witness to that. Oh, so. Then you must show me your embroidery. I embroider and draw patterns myself a little. If you want a judge of your work, you must apply to me. I bet the colours don't look well by candlelight. You shall see all in the morning, sir. And why not now, my angel? Such beauty fires beyond the powers of resistance. Ah, the father here, my old luck. I never nicked seven, but I did not throw eggs. Ace three times following. So, madam. So, I find this is your modest lover. <laughs> this your humble admirer that kept his eyes fixed on the ground and only adored at a humble distance. Oh, Kate, Kate, Kate. Aren't I not ashamed to deceive your father so? Never trust me, my dear papa. But he's still the modest man I first took him for. You'll be convinced of it as well as I. By the hand of my body, I believe his impudence is infectious. Didn't I see him seize your hand? Didn't I see him haul your bunk like a milkmaid? And now you talk of his respect and his modesty, forsooth. But if I shortly convince you of his modesty, that he has only the faults that will pass off with time and the virtues that will improve with age, I hope you'll forgive him. The girl would actually make one run mad. I tell you, I'll not be convinced. I am convinced. He has scarcely been three hours in this house, and already he has encroached on all my prerogatives. Oh, you may like his impudence and call it modesty, but my son-in-law, madam, must have very, very different qualifications. Sir, I ask but this night to convince you. Oh, you shall not have half the time, for I have thought of turning him out this very hour. Give me that hour, then, and I hope to satisfy you. Huh? Well, an hour let it be, then. But I'll have no trifling with your father. All fair and open. Do you mind me? I hope, sir, you have ever found that I considered your commands as my pride. For your kindness is such that my duty as yet has been inclination. <laughs> Sir Charles Marlowe expected here this night. Where have you had your information? I just saw his letter to Mr. Hardcastle, in which he tells him he intends setting out a few hours after his son. Then, my Constance, all must be completed before he arrives. He knows me, and should he find me here, would discover my name and perhaps my designs to the rest of the family. The jewels, I hope, are safe? Yes, yes. I've sent them to Marlowe, who keeps the keys of our baggage. In the meantime, I'll go to prepare matters for our elopement. Well, success attend you. I'll go amuse my aunt with the old pretense of a violent passion for my cousin. I wonder what Hastings could mean by sending me so valuable a thing as a casket to keep for him when he knows the only place I have is the seat of a postcoach at an indoor. Have you deposited the casket with the landlady as I ordered you? Have you put it into her own hands? Yes, Your Honour. Uh, she said she'd keep it safe, did she? Yes, she said she'd keep it safe enough. She asked me how I came by it. And she said she had a great mind to make me give an account of myself. <laughs> Are they safe, however? What an unaccountable set of beings have we got amongst. This little barmaid, though, runs in my head most strangely and drives out the absurdities of all the rest of the family. She's mine. She must be mine, or I am greatly mistaken. Bless me, I quite forgot to tell her that I intended to prepare at the bottom of the garden. Marlowe here. And in spirits, too. Give me joy, George. Crown me, shadow me with laurels. Well, George, after all, we bodiced fellows don't want for success among the women. Some women, you mean. But what success has your honour's modesty been crowned with now that it grows so insolent upon us? Didn't you see the tempting, brisk, lovely little thing that runs about the house with a bunch of keys to its girdle? Well, and what then? She's mine, you rogue, you. Such fire, such motion, such eyes, such lips. Uh, but egad, she would not let me kiss them, though. Uh, but are you so sure, so very sure of her? My man, she talked of showing me her work above stairs, and I'm to improve the pattern. But how can you, Charles, go about to rob a woman of her honour? 
I don't intend to rob her. Take my word for it, there's nothing in this house I shan't honestly pay for. Mm, I believe the girl has virtue. And if she has, I shall be the last man in the world that would attempt to corrupt it. Oh, you've taken care, I hope, of the casket I sent you to lock up. It's in safety. Yes, yes, it's safe enough. I have taken care of it. But how could you think the seat of a post coach at an indoor a place of safety? Yeah, <laughs> numbskull. I've taken better precautions for you than you did for yourself. I have. What? I've sent it to the landlady to keep for you. To the landlady? The landlady. You did? I did. She is to be answerable for its forthcoming, you know. Yes, she'll bring it forth with her witness. Oh. Oh, wasn't I right? I believe you'll allow that I acted prudently upon this occasion. You must not see my uneasiness. You, you seem a little disconcerted, though, methinks. Uh, sure, nothing has happened. No, no, nothing. <laughs> Never was in better spirits in all my life. <laughs> and so you left it with the landlady, who no doubt very readily undertook the charge. <laughs> Rather too readily. For she not only kept the casket, but through her great precaution, was going to keep <laughs> the messenger, too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they are safe, however. As a guinea in a miser's purse. So now all hopes of fortune are at an end and we must set off without it. Well, Charles, I'll um, leave you to your meditations on the pretty barmaid. And may you be as successful for yourself as you have been for me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, George. I ask no more. <laughs> I no longer know my own house. It's turned all topsy-turvy. His servants have got drunk. I'll bear it no longer. I... Oh, and yet, from my respect for his father, I'll become Mr. Marlowe, your servant. I'm your very humble servant. Sir, your humble servant. What's to be the wonder now? I believe, sir, that you must be sensible, sir, that no man alive ought to be more welcome than your father's son, sir. I hope you think so. I do, from my soul, sir. I don't want much entreaty. I generally make my father's son welcome wherever he goes. I believe you do, from my soul, sir. But though I say nothing of your own conduct, that of your servants is insufferable. The manner of... Their manner of drinking is setting a very bad example in this house. I protest, my very good sir, that's no fault of mine. If they don't drink as they ought, they are to blame. I ordered them not to spare the cellar, I did, I assure you. Here, yeah, let one of my servants come up. My positive directions were that I did not drink myself. They should make up for my deficiencies below. <laughs> then then they, they had your orders for what they do? Well, they have, I assure you. You shall hear from one of themselves. You, gentlemen, come forward, Silla. Uh, what were my orders? The way you're not told to uh, drink freely and call for what you thought fit for the good of the house. Oh, give me patience. Leisure, honour, liberty, and free street forever. Though I am but a servant, I am as good as another man. I'll drink. For no man before supper, sir, dammy. Good liquor will sit upon a good supper, but a good supper will not sit upon a, upon a conscience. <laughs> you see, my old friend, the fellow was as drunk as he can possibly be. I don't know what you'd have better unless you'd have the poor devil soused in a beer barrel. Soon as he'll have me distracted if I contain myself a moment longer, Mr. Marlowe, sir. I have submitted to your insolence for more than four hours, and I see no likelihood of its coming to an end. I am now resolved to be master here, sir, and I desire that you and your drunken pack may leave my house directly. Leave your house? Yes, sir. Sure, you jest, my good friend. What, when I'm doing what I can to please you? Look, I tell you, sir, you don't please me, so I desire you'll leave my house. Sir. <laughs> sure, you cannot be serious. At this time of night, and such a night... You only mean to banter me. I, I, I tell you, sir, I am serious. And now that my passions are roused, I say this house is mine, sir. And this house is mine that I command you to leave it directly. <laughs> a puddle in a storm. I shan't stir a step, I assure you. <laughs> this your house, fellow? It's my house. This is my house. Mine while I choose to stay here. What right have you to bid me leave this house, sir? I never met with such impudence. Curse me. Never in my whole life before. Uh, no, not I. Confound me if I ever did. To come to my house, to call for what he likes, to turn me out of my own chair, 
to insult the family, to order his servants to get drunk, and then to turn and tell me this house is mine, sir. <laughs> By all that's impudent, it makes me laugh. It makes me laugh. <laughs> Please, sir, since you take the house, you will think you of uh, taking the rest of the furniture. <laughs> there's a pair of silver candlesticks, and there's a fire screen, and, oh, look, here's a pair of brazen nosed bellows. Uh, perhaps you may take offence to them. Bring me your bill, uh, sir. Bring me your bill, and let's make no more words about it. There, there. A set of prints, too, sir. What think you of the rake's progress for your own apartment? Give me your bill, I say, and I'll leave you and your infernal oh, house directly. There's a table, a mahogany table, a mahogany table that you may see your own, your own face in. My sir. bill, I say. I forgot a chair. Oh, my own great chair for your own particular slumbers after a hearty meal. Sir, bring me my bill, I say, and let's hear no more words of it. From your father's letter to me, I was taught to expect a well-bred, modest young man as a visitor here, but now I find him no better than a coxcomb and a bully. But he'll be down here presently, and so here more of it is. How's this? Sure, I've not mistaken the house. Everything looks like an inn. The servants cry, coming, the attendance is awkward, but the barmaid, too, to attend us. But she is here and will further inform me. Uh, uh, with us so fast, child. Uh, uh, a word with you. Let it be short, then I'm in a hurry. I believe he begins to find out his mistake, but it's too soon quite to undeceive him. Pray, child, answer me one question. Uh, what are you and what may your business in this house be? A relation of the family, sir. A what? A poor relation? Oh, yes, sir, a poor relation appointed to keep the keys and see that the guests want nothing in my party given. Uh, that is, you act as the barmaid of this inn. Inn? Oh, la, <laughs> put that in your head. One of the best families in the county keep an inn. <laughs> Oh, Mr. Hardcastle's house, in it. Mr. Hardcastle's house? <laughs> is this house Mr. Hardcastle's house, child? I sure, whose else should it be? Oh, so then all's out, <laughs> and I have been damnably imposed on. Oh, confound my stupid head. I shall be laughed at over the whole town. I shall be stuck up in caricatura in all the print shops, the Dalissimo Macaroni, to mistake this house of all others for an inn and my father's old friend for an innkeeper. Oh, what a swaggering puppy must he take me for? What a silly puppy do I find myself? There again, may I be hanged, my dear, but I mistook you for the barmaid. Dear me. Dear me, I, I'm sure there's nothing in my behaviour to put me up on, on a level with one of that stamp, sir. But nothing, my dear, nothing. But I was in for a list of blunders and could not help making you a subscriber. My stupidity saw everything the wrong way. But it's over. This house, I... No more show my face in. Oh, I, I hope, sir, I've done nothing to disoblige you. I, I'm sure I should be sorry to affront any gentleman who has been so polite and said so many civil things to me. I, I'm sure I should be sorry if, if he left the family upon my account. I, I'm sure I should be sorry if people said anything amiss, since I, I have no fortune but, but my character. <laughs> By heaven, she weeps. This is the first mark of tenderness I ever had from a modest woman, and it touches me. <laughs> Excuse me, my lovely girl. You are the only part of the family I leave with reluctance. But to be plain with you, the difference of our birth, fortune, and education make an honorable connection impossible. I can never harbor a thought of betraying simplicity that trusted in my honor or bringing ruin upon one whose only fault was being too lovely. Oh, generous man, I now begin to admire him. But, but I'm sure my family is as good as Miss Hardcastle's. And though I'm poor, that's no great misfortune to a contented mind. And until this moment, I never thought that it was bad to want fortune. And why now, my pretty simplicity? Because it puts me at a distance from one that if I had a thousand pounds, I would give it all to. Oh, this simplicity <laughs> bewitches me. So that if I stay, I'm undone. I must make one bold effort and leave her. Your partiality in my favor, my dear, touches me most sensibly, and were I to live for myself alone, I could easily fix my choice, but I owe too much to the opinion of the world, too much to the authority of a father, so that I can scarcely speak it. 
It affects me. Farewell. I never knew half his merit till now. He shall not go if I have power or art to detain him. I'll still preserve the character in which I stoop to conquer, but will undeceive my papa, who perhaps may laugh him out of his resolution. Ah, oh, you may steal for yourselves the next time. I've done my duty. She's got the jewels again, that's a sure thing, but she believes it always a mistake of the servants. But, my dear cousin, sure you won't forsake us in this distress. If she is in the least suspects that I am going off, I shall certainly be locked up or sent to my aunt Pedigree's, which is ten times worse. To be sure, aunts have all kinds of damn bad things, but what can I do? I've got you a pair of horses that will fly like whistle jacket, and I'm sure you can't say, but I've courted you nicely before her face. Ooh, ooh, here she comes. We must court a bit or two more for fear she should suspect us. Well, I was greatly fluttered, to be sure. But my son tells me it was all a mistake of the servants. I shan't be easy, however, till they're fairly married, and then let her keep her own fortune. But what do I see? Fondling together as I'm alive. I never saw Tony so sprightly before. Ah, have I caught you, my pretty doves? What billing, exchanging stolen glances and broken murmurs. Ah. As for murmurs, Mother, we grumble a little now and then, to be sure, but there's no love lost between us. A mere sprinkling Tony upon the flame, only to make it burn brighter. Cousin Tony promises to give more of his company at home. Indeed, he shan't leave us any more. It won't leave us, Cousin Tony, will it? Oh, he's a pretty creature. No, I'd sooner leave my horse in a pound than leave you when you smile upon one's own. Your laugh makes you so becoming. <laughs> Agreeable cousin. Who can help admiring that natural humour? That pleasant, broad, red, thoughtless arm. Oh. <laughs> it is a bold face. Pretty innocent. Oh, I'm sure I've always loved Cousin Con's hazel eyes and her pretty long fingers that she twists this way and that over the haspy coals like a parcel of bobbin. Oh, he would charm the bird from the tree. I was never so happy before. My boy takes after his father, poor Mr. Lumpkin, exactly. The jewels, my dear Con, shall be yours incontinently. You shall have them. Oh, isn't he a sweet boy, my dear? You shall be married tomorrow, and we'll put off the rest of his education like Dr. Drowsy's sermons to a fitter opportunity. Where's the squire? Oh, I got a letter for your worship. Give it to my mamma. She reads all my letters first. I had orders to deliver it into your own hands. Where does it come from? You wish him an her to the letter itself. I could wish to know, though. I'm done, I'm done. A letter to him from Hastings. I know the hand. If my aunt sees it, we are ruined forever. I'll keep her employed a little if I can. But I have not told you, madam, of my cousin's smart answer just now to Mr. Marlowe. We so laugh. You must know, madam, this way a little, for he must not hear us. Now, damn cramped piece of penmanship as ever I saw in my life. I can read you a print hand very well, but here there are such handles and shanks and dashes that one can scarce tell the head from the tail. To Anthony Lumpkin Esquire. Uh, uh, that's very odd. I can read the outside of my letters where my own name is well enough, but when I come to open it, it's all buzz. That's hard. That's very hard, for the inside of the letters always a cream with a correspondence. <laughs> And so my son was too hard for the philosopher. Yes, madam. But you must hear the rest, madam. A little more this way, or he may hear us. You will hear how he puzzled him again. Oh. He seems strangely puzzled now himself, isn't he? Oh, I can found it up and down on as if it was disguised in liquor. Dear sir, oh yes, that. Then there's an M and a T and an S. But whether the next be a Z or R, confound me, I cannot tell. What's that, my dear? Can I give you any assistance? Pray, aunt, let me read it. Nobody reads a cramped hand better than I. Do you know who it's from? Oh, can't tell. Hey, except from Dick Ginger, the feeder. Aye, so it is. Dear Squire, uh -huh. 
Hoping that you're in health, as I am at this present, the gentleman of the Shake Bag Club ah. has cut the gentleman of Goose Green quite ah. out of feather. The odds, um, odd battle and long fighting. Oh, mm -hmm. here, here, it's all about cocks and fighting. It is of no consequence. Put it up, put it up. Oh, I, I tell you, miss, it's of all the consequence in a world. I would not lose the rest of it for a guinea. Here, here, mother, do you make it out of no consequence? How's this? Dear Squire, I am now waiting for Miss Neville with a post-chaise and pair at the bottom of the garden, but I find my horses yet unable to perform the journey. I expect you will assist us with a fresh pair of horses as you promised. Dispatch is necessary as the hag, I the hag, your mother, will otherwise suspect us. Yours, Hastings. Grant me patience, I shall run distracted. My rage chokes me. I hope, madam, you'll suspend your resentment for a few moments and not impute to me any impertinence or sinister design that belongs to another. Fine spoken, madam. You are most miraculously polite and engaging and quite the very pink of courtesy and circumspection, madam. And you, your great ill-fashioned oaf, with scarce enough sense to keep your mouth shut, were you two who joined against me? But I'll defeat all your plots in a moment. As for you, madam, since you have a fresh pair of horses ready, it would be cruel to disappoint them. So if you please, instead of running away with your spark, prepare this moment to run off with me. Your old aunt pedigree will keep you secure, I'll warrant me. You two, sir, may mount your horse and guard us upon the way. Here, Thomas, Roger, Diggory, I'll show you that I wish you better than you do yourselves. So... Now I'm completely ruined. Aye, oh, that's a sure thing. What better could be expected from being connected with such a stupid fool? And after all the nods and signs I made By him... By the laws, miss, it was your own cleverness and not my stupidity that did your business. You were so nice and so busy with your shake bags and goose greens. I thought you could never be making believe. So, sir, I find by my servant that you've shown my letter and betrayed us. Was this well done, young gentleman? Here's another. Ask Mr. who betrayed you. He caught it was her doing, not mine. So, I have been finally used here among you. Rendered contemptible, driven into ill manners, despised, insulted, laughed at. Here's another. We shall have old Bedlam broke loose presently. And there, sir, is the gentleman to whom we all owe every obligation. What can I say to him? A mere boy, an idiot, whose ignorance and age are a protection. A poor contemptible booby that would but disgrace correction. Yet with cunning and malice enough to make himself merry with all our embarrassments. An insensible cub. Repeat with tricks and mischief. Ah! Damn me, but I thought you both one after the other. We're baskets. As for him, he's below resentment. But your conduct, Mr. Hastings, requires an explanation. You knew of my mistakes, yet would not undeceive me. Tortured as I am with my own disappointments, is this a time for explanations? It is not friendly, Mr. Marlowe. But, Mr. Sir. Marlowe, we never kept on your mistake till it was too late to undeceive you. Be pacified. My mistress desires you'll get ready immediately, madam. The horses are put in two. Your hat and things are in the next room. We're to go 30 miles before morning. Well, well, I'll come present. Was it well done, sir, to assist in rendering me ridiculous, to hang me out for the score of all my acquaintance? Depend upon it, sir, I shall expect an explanation. Was it well done, sir, if you're upon that subject, to deliver what I entrusted to yourself to the care of another, sir? Mr. Hastings, Mr. Marlowe, why will you increase my distress where this groundless dispute I implore, I entreat Mr. you? Mr. Marlowe! Well, you're talking, madam. Why, mistress is impatient. I come. Pray, be pacified. If I leave you thus, I shall die with apprehension. Your fan, muff and gloves, madam. The horses are waiting. Oh, Mr. Marlowe, if you knew what a scene of constraint and ill nature lies before me, I'm sure it would convert your resentment into pity. I'm so distracted with a variety of passions that I don't know what to do. Forgive me, madam. George, forgive me. You know my hasty temper and should not exhaust me. Oh, the torture of my situation is my only excuse. Well, my dear Hastings, if you have that esteem for me that I think, that I'm sure you have, your constancy for three years will but increase the happiness of our future connection. Miss Neville, Constance, why Constance, I say? I'm coming. Well, constancy. Remember, constancy is the word. My heart, how can I support this? To be so near happiness and such happiness. Oh. You see now, young gentleman, the effects of your folly. What might be amusement to you is here disappointment and even distress. God, I have hit it. It's here. Your hands. Yours and yours, me poor sulky. <coughs> me boots there, eh? 
Meet me two hours hence at the bottom of the garden, and if you don't find Tony Lumpkin a more good-natured fella than you thought for, I'll give you leave to take me best horse and bet bouncer into the bargain. <laughs> Come along, me boots there. <laughs> Saw the old lady and Miss Neville drive off, you say? Yes, Your Honour. They went off in a post coach, and the young squire went on horseback. They're thirty miles off by this time. Then all my hopes are over. Yes, sir. Oh, Sir Charles has arrived. He and the old gentleman at the house have been laughing at Mr. Marlowe's mistake this half hour. Oh, they're coming this way. Then I must not be seen. So now to my fruitless appointment at the bottom of the garden. This is about the time. <laughs> <laughs> peremptory tone, in which he sent forth his sublime command. And the reserve with which I suppose he treated all your advances. Oh, yes. uh, and yet, Charles, he might have seen something in me above a common innkeeper. Oh. Yes, Dick, but he mistook you for an uncommon innkeeper. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I'm in too good spirits to think of anything but joy. Yes, my dear friend, this union of our families will make our personal friendships hereditary. And though my daughter's fortune is but small... Why, Dick, will you talk of fortune to me? My son is possessed of more than a competence already, and can want nothing but a good and virtuous girl to share his happiness and increase it. If they like each other, as you say they do? If, man, I tell you they do like each other, my daughter is good as told me so. Ah, but girls are apt to flatter themselves, you know. I saw him grasp her hand in the warmest manner myself, and... Here he comes, here he comes to put you out of your ifs, I warned him. <laughs> I come, sir, once more to ask pardon for my strange conduct. I can scarce reflect on my insolence without confusion. <laughs> <laughs> tut, 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 boy, a trifle, you take it too gravely. An hour or two's laughing with my daughter will set all to rights again. She'll never think you the worse of it. Sir, I shall always be proud of her approbation. Uh, approbation? <laughs> That's but a cold word, Mr. Marlowe. If I've not deceived you of something more than approbation thereabouts, huh? <laughs> you take me. Really, sir, I have not that happiness. Uh, well, uh, come, 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 boy. I'm an old fellow and know what's what as well as you that are younger. I know what has passed between you. <laughs> but, Mum. Sure, sir, nothing has passed between us but the most profound respect on my side and the most distant reserve on hers. You, you don't think, sir, that my impudence has been passed upon all the rest of the family? Uh, impudence? No, I don't say that. Not quite impudence. <laughs> Though girls like to be played with and, and rumpled a little too sometimes. <laughs> but I, she's told no tales. No, 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 I assure you. I never gave her the slightest cause. Uh, well, well, I like modesty in its place well enough, but this is overacting, young gentleman. You may be open. Your father and I will like you the better for it. May I die, sir, if ever I... I tell you, she don't dislike you, and as I'm sure you like her... Oh dear, sir, I, I protest. I see no reason why you should not be joined as fast as the parson can tie. Oh, but hear me, sir. Your father approves a match. I admire it. Every moment's delay will be doing a mischief, so... But why won't you hear me, sir? By all that's just and true, I never gave Miss Hardcastle the slightest mark of my attachment, or even the most distant hint to suspect me of affection. We had but one interview, and that was formal, modest, and uninteresting. Now his modest impudence is beyond bearing. And you never grasped her hand or made any protestations? As heaven is my witness, I came down in obedience to your commands. I saw the lady without emotion and parted without reluctance. I hope you'll exact no further proofs of my duty, nor prevent me from leaving a house in which I suffer so many mortifications. I'm astonished at the air of sincerity with which he parted. And I'm astonished at the deliberate intrepidity of his assurance. I dare pledge my life and honour upon his truth. Here comes my daughter. And I would stake my happiness upon her veracity. Kate. Kate, come here, child. Answer us sincerely and without reserve. Has Mr. Marlowe made you any professions of love and affection? Well, the question is very abrupt, sir, but... Since you require unreserved sincerity, I think he has. You see? And pray, madam, have you and my son had more than one interview? Yes, sir, several. You see? But did he profess any attachment? A lasting one. Did he talk of love? Oh, much, sir. Amazing. And all this formally? Formally. Uh, now, my friend, I hope you're satisfied. And how did he behave, madam? As most professed admirers do. Said some civil things of my face. 
talked much of his want of merit and the greatness of mine, mentioned his heart, gave a short tragedy speech, and ended with pretended rapture. Now I'm perfectly convinced indeed. I know his conversation among women to be modest and submissive. This forward, canting, ranting manner by no means describes him, and I'm confident he never sat for the picture. Then what, sir, if I should convince you to your face of my sincerity? If you and my papa in about half an hour will place yourselves behind that screen, you shall hear him declare his passion to me in person. Agreed. And if I find him what you describe, all my happiness in him must have an end. Just if you don't find him what I describe, I fear my happiness must never have a beginning. What an idiot am I to wait here for a fellow who probably takes a delight in mortifying me. He never intended to be punctual, and I'll wait no longer. Ah, what do I see? It is he, and perhaps with news of Constance, my honest squire. I now find you a man of your word. This looks like friendship. Ay, I'm your friend, and the best friend you have in the world, if you knew, but oh, whew. Oh, this riding by night by the boys cursedly tiresome. He shook me worse than the basket of a stagecoach. Oh, 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 where did you leave your fellow travellers? Are they in safety? Are they housed? I've been 20 miles in two hours and a half. is no such bad driving. The poor beast of smoke for it. Rabbit me, but I'd rather ride 40 miles after a fox than 10 with such vermin. But, but where have you left the ladies? I die with impatience. Left them? Why, where should I leave them? But where I found them? This is a riddle. <laughs> riddle me this, then. What's that that goes round the house and round the house and never touches the house? I'm still astray. Ah, oh, that's it, man. I led them astray. Oh. By jingo, there's not a pond or slough within five miles of the place, but they can sell the taste of them. <laughs> I understand. You took them in a round while they supposed themselves going forward. Yes. And so you have at last brought them home again. You shall hear. I first took them down Featherbed Lane, yeah. where we stuck fast in the mud. Yeah. I then rattled them crack over the stones of up and down hill. <laughs> I then introduced them to the gibbet on any tree leaf. And from that, with a circumbendibus, I fairly lodged them in the horse pond at the bottom of the garden. But no accident, I hope. No, no. I mean, Mother is confoundedly frightened. Oh. She thinks it's a 40 miles off. <laughs> <laughs> She's sick of the journey and the cattle can scarce crawl. So, if your own horses be ready, you may whip off with cousin and I'll be bound that no soul here can but a foot to follow you. My dear friend, how can I be grateful? I know. It's dear friend, noble squire. Just now it was all idiot. Cub and run me through the body. Damn your way of fighting, I say. After we take a knock in this part of the country, we shake hands and be friends. Ah, the rebuke is just. But I must hasten to relieve Miss Neville. If you keep the old lady employed, I promise to take care of the young one. Never fear me. Oh. If she comes, vanish. Oh, she's got from the pond and draggled up to the waist like a mermaid. Oh, oh. oh Tony, I'm killed. Shook. Battered to death. I shall never survive it. That last joke that laid us against the quickset hedge has done my business. Oh, like Mama, it was oh. all your own fault. You would be for running oh. away by night without knowing one inch of the way. Oh, I wish we were home again. I never met so many accidents in so short a journey. Drenched in the mud, overturned in a ditch, stuck fast in a slough, jolted to a jelly, and at last to lose our way. <laughs> Where do you think we are, Tony? In my guess, we should be upon Crackskull Common, about 40 miles from home. <gasps> oh, Lud, oh, Lud. The most notorious spot in all the country. We only want a robbery to make a complete night on. Don't be afraid, Mama, don't be afraid. Two of the five that kept here are hanged, oh. and the other three may not find us. Oh. Don't be afraid. <gasps> Is that a man that's galloping behind us? <gasps> No, it's only a tree. Oh, Don't be afraid. Oh, the fright will certainly kill me. Shh, shh, shh. <laughs> Do you see anything like a black hat moving behind the thicket? Oh, death. Mm? No, it's only a cow. Don't be afraid, Mama. Don't be afraid. <gasps> it's up and Tony. I see a man coming towards us. I, I'm sure, Aunt. If he perceives us... We're undone. Father-in-law, by all it's unlucky, come to take one of his night walks. Oh. Shh, 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 oh. shh, 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 shh. It's a highway, oh. man, with pistols as oh. long as oh. my arm. What oh, damn deal-looking fella. Oh, good heaven, defend us. He, he approaches. Do you, do you 
hide yourself in that thicket over there and leave me to manage him. If there be any danger, I'll I'll cough and cry. <coughs> when I cough, you be sure to keep close. Who's there? Who's there? Who's there? Well, I'm mistaken. I heard voices of people in want of help. Anybody? Oh, Tony. Tony, is that you? Hi. <coughs> Hey, I did not expect you so soon back. Are your mother in our charge and safety? I'm oh, very safe, sir, at me aunt pedigrees. <coughs> oh, hmm? I find this danger. Forty miles in three hours. Well, I'm sure that's too much, my youngster. Stout horses and willing minds make short journeys, as they say, sir. <coughs> oh, you do the dear boy, no harm. Hush. I heard a voice here. I should be glad to know from whence it came. Oh, it was I, sir, talking to myself, sir. Huh? I was saying that forty miles in three hours was very good going. <coughs> Oh, I've got a sore cold, I think. I think I've been out in the air. We'll go in if you please, sir. Oh, <laughs> yourself, you didn't answer yourself. I'm certain I heard two voices. And I'm resolved to find the other. Oh, 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 what need you go, sir, if I tell you? I'll lay down my life for the truth, sir. I'll tell you all, sir. I tell you I will not be detained. Oh, bloody murder, my dear, oh, my darling. Oh, you could get my oh, bitch oh, me to my money. Take my money, my life. But spare that young gentleman, spare my child, if you have any mercy. No, wife, but I'm a Christian. Take compassion on us, good Mr. Highwayman. Take our money, our watches, all we have, but spare our lives. We will never bring you to justice. Indeed, we won't, good Mr. Highwayman. Oh, I believe the woman's out of her senses. Oh. What, Dorothy, don't you know me? Oh, oh. Mr. Hardcastle is ever alive. Oh. <laughs> your wits so far from home when you're you're within 40 yards of your own door <laughs> no this is one of your old tricks you graceless rogue you oh, there there don't you know the gate and the mulberry tree <laughs> and don't you remember the horse pond my dear yes i shall remember the horse pond as long as i live yeah. of course my isn't <laughs> And is it to you, you graceless varmint, I owe all this? I'll teach you to abuse your mother, I will. Ye cud, mother, all the parry say you have spoiled me, and say you may take the fruit some. I'll spoil you, I will. There's morality, however, in his reply. My dear Constance, why will you deliberate thus? If we delay a moment, all is lost forever. I find it impossible. My spirits are so sunk with the agitations I have suffered that I am unable to face any new danger. Two or three years' patience will at last crown us with happiness. Such a tedious delay is worse than inconstancy. Let us fly, my charmer. Let us date our happiness from this very moment. No, Mr. Hastings, oh. no. In the moment of passion, fortune may be despised, but it ever produces a lasting repentance. I am resolved to apply to Mr. Hardcastle's compassion and justice for redress. But though he had the will, he has not the power to relieve you. But he has the influence, and upon that I am resolved to rely. <sighs> I have no hopes. But since you persist, I must reluctantly obey you. <laughs> A situation am I in? If what you say appears, I shall then find a guilty son. If what he says be true, I shall then lose one that of all others I most wished for a daughter. I am proud of your approbation, and to show I merit it, if you place yourselves as I directed, you shall hear his explicit declaration. But he comes. I'll to your father and keep him to the appointment. Though so pre <laughs> so prepared for setting out, I come once more to take leave. Nor did I till this moment know the pain I feel in the separation. I believe these sufferings cannot be very great, sir, which you can so easily remove. A day or two longer perhaps might lessen your uneasiness by showing the little value of what you now think proper to regret. This girl every moment improves upon me. It must not be. 
I have already trifled too long with my heart. My very pride begins to submit to my passion. The disparity of education and fortune, the anger of a parent and the contempt of my equals begin to lose their weight and nothing can restore me to myself but this painful effort of resolution. Then go, sir. I'll urge nothing more to detain you. Though my family be as good as hers, you came down to visit, and my education, I hope, not inferior. What are these advantages without equal affluence? I must remain contented with the mockery of your addresses, while all your serious aims are fixed on fortune. Here, yeah, behind this screen. I, I make no noise. I'll engage my Kate covers in this confusion at last. Oh, by heaven, madam, fortune was ever my smallest consideration. <laughs> your beauty at first caught my eye, for who could see that without emotion? Oh, sir. And every moment that I converse with you steals in some new grace, heightens the picture and gives it stronger expression. What at first seemed rustic plainness now appears refined simplicity. What seemed forward assurance now strikes me as the result of courageous innocence and conscious virtue. What can it mean? He amazes me. I told you how it would be. I am now determined to stay, madam. And I have too good an opinion of my father's discernment when he sees you to doubt his approbation. No, Mr. Marlowe. I will not. I cannot detain you. Do you think I could suffer a connection in which there is the smallest room for repentance? Do you think I would take the mean advantage of a transient passion to load you with confusion? Do you think I could ever relish that happiness which was acquired by lessening yours? By all that's good, I can have no happiness but what's in your power to grant me. I will stay, even contrary to your wishes. Sir, I must entreat your desist. As our acquaintance began, so let it end in indifference. I might have given an hour or two to levity, but seriously, Mr. Marlowe, do you think I could ever submit to a connection where I must appear mercenary and you imprudent? Do you think I could ever catch at the confident address of a secure admirer? Does this look like security? Does this look like confidence? No, madam, every moment that shows me your merit only serves to increase my confusion here on my knees. I can hold it no longer. Charles, Charles, how have you deceived me? Is this your indifference, your uninteresting conversation? Your cold contempt to your formal interview. What have you to say now? That I am all amazement. What can it mean? Well, it means that you can say and unsay things at pleasure, that you can address a lady in private and deny it in public, that you are one story for us and another for my daughter. Daughter? This lady, your daughter? Yes, sir, my daughter, my Kate. <laughs> <laughs> Whose else should she be? Oh, the devil. <laughs> very identical tall squinting lady you were pleased to take me for. <sighs> she that you addressed as the mild, modest, sentimental man of gravity and the bold, forward, agreeable rattle of the ladies' club. Oh, soon, there's no bearing this. It's worse than death. <laughs> Which of your characters, sir, will you give us leave to address you? As the faltering gentleman with looks on the ground that speaks just to be heard and hates hypocrisy. Or the loud, confident creature that keeps it up with Mrs. Mantrap and old Miss Biddy Buckskin till three in the morning. Oh, curse <laughs> my noisy head. I never attempted to be impudent yet, but I was not taken down. I'm must be gone. Oh, you shall by the hand of my body. I oh, see. It was all a mistake. Oh, and I'm rejoiced to find it. Oh. No, no, you shall not go, I tell you, sir. I know she'll forgive you. Oh. Won't you forgive him, Kate? Oh. Yes, yes. We'll all forgive you. <laughs> Take courage, man. So they're gone off. Let them go. I care not. <laughs> uh, uh, who's gone? My dutiful niece and her gentleman, Mr. Hastings, from town. He who came down with our modest visitor here. Who? My honest George Hastings? As worthy a fellow as lives, and the girl could not have made a more prudent choice. Well, then, by the hand of my body, I'm proud of the connection. Well, if he's taken away the lady, he has not taken her fortune. Uh, that remains in this family to console us for her loss. Oh, sure, Dorothy, you would not be so mercenary. Aye, oh, that's my affair, not yours. But you know that if your son, when of age, refuses to marry his cousin, her whole fortune is then at her own disposal. Aye, but he's not of age, and she has not thought proper to wait for his refusal. Mr. Hastings. What? Returned so soon? I begin not to like it. Mr. Hardcastle, for my late attempt to fly off with your niece, let my present confusion be my punishment. We are now come back to appeal from your justice to your humanity. By her father's consent, I first paid her my addresses, and our passions were first founded in duty. Since his death, I have been obliged to stoop to dissimulation to avoid oppression. In an hour of levity, I was ready even to give up my fortune to secure my choice. But I'm now recovered from the delusion and hope from your tenderness what is denied me from a nearer connection. Sure, sure. This is all the waning end of a modern novel. Well, be it what it will, I'm glad they've come back to reclaim that you. Come hither, Tony boy. 
Uh, Tony, uh, do you refuse this lady's hand, whom I now offer you? What signifies my refusing? You know, I can't refuse it till I'm of age, Father. Uh, while I thought concealing your age, boy, was likely to conduce to your improvement, I concurred with your mother's desire to keep it a secret. But since I find she turns it to a wrong use, I must now declare that you've been of age these three months. Oh, of age? <laughs> Am I of age, Father? About three months. Then you'll see the first use I'll make of my liberty. <laughs> Witness, all men, by these presents, that I, Anthony Lumpkin, Esquire of Black Place, refuse you, Constantia Neville, master oh. of no place at all, for my true and lawful wife. So Constance Neville may marry whom she pleases, and Tony Lumpkin is his own man again. Oh, brave squire. My worthy friend. My undutiful offspring. Joy, my dear George, I give you joy sincerely, and could I prevail upon my little tyrant here to be less arbitrary? Oh, sir. I should be the happiest man alive if you would return me the favour. Come, madam, you are now driven to the very last scene of all your contrivances. I know you like him. I'm sure he loves you, and you must and shall have him. And I say so too. <laughs> Mr. Marlowe, if she makes as good a wife as she has a daughter, I don't believe you'll ever repent the bargain. <laughs> so now to supper, and tomorrow we shall gather all the poor of the parish about us, and the mistakes of the night shall be crowned with a merry morning. <laughs> uh, so, boy, take her. And as you've been mistaken in the mistress, my wish is that you may never be mistaken in the wife. 